everybody. It's great to see you today. Welcome to Living Power, your online Bible study. We're walking through the Bible in a year, and I can't believe that it's over halfway finished. Today is July 19th, and we're in the book of Isaiah. We're going to be covering a little bit on Isaiah and Micah today, um, and both discuss end times prophecy. So if you're keeping an end times notebook, today would be a good day to pull that out. We're going to look at some more things here. Um, we're going to jump right in today and start with Isaiah 34. And he is kind of calling out to the nations. And what verses 1 to 3 here in Isaiah 34 uh, are describing is the last battle, the battle of Armageddon. And we just read Isaiah 32 and 33 where we saw God as king and Israel being set up as a theocracy, which is how when God formed Israel, it was always how he had intended it to be anyway. And today we're going to look at the end battle. And of course, we talk about the ushering in of the millennial kingdom. These verses one to three paint a military picture for us. I mean, you have to just see yourself in the battle, on the battlefront. There are horses. You can hear the bridles um, shaking. You can hear the uh, horses making noise and stomping. Just imagine being in the battle ready to fight. And just picture noise and machines and guns and just chaos everywhere. And the nations are poised for battle. And the enemy is slaughtered. And slaughtered in this, these verses, the land is drenched with blood. And bodies are everywhere. And they are left to rot out in the open fields. These verses is a, um, are a picture of Armageddon, the battle that has not yet taken place. And right after that, we see cosmic disturbances happening in verse 4. And... These cosmic disturbances, which describe the sun and the moon being darkened and the stars not shining any longer, the, um, the scripture talks about them falling from the sky. These pictures are repeated in scripture, and I thought you might like to know where they are. They're in Matthew 24, 29, Joel 2, 10, and Revelation 6, 13 and 14. And these cosmic disturbances happen right before he, Jesus, comes again and this last battle is taking place. So, you know, sometimes I'll turn on like a history channel and, um, or some, you know, some channel on the cable network and it will, they'll be talking about these kinds of things where the sun got dark or it appears that the stars are falling or whatever, you know, they're talking about. But they can't, and, and they refer to, um, you know, to these passages. But these passages are, are actually talking about the end times battle and what will happen. Um, what will happen then? The uh, commentary, Isaiah's um, scripture, continues in verse 6. And describes as all of this blood and all of this war as being a sacrifice not offered this time by men, but a sacrifice that God offers himself. And God sees his enemies here as he calls them as rams, goats, oxen, and bulls. He's calling them by an animal name because it is God now who has brought these nations together and is conducting the sacrifice. All right, in Isaiah 35, we jump, we jump here to the millennial kingdom, the thousand-year reign of Christ, and we see that the Garden of Eden is restored in this time period. Nature is set free from the curse here in Isaiah 35. There are streams of water in the desert, just as it must have been in the Garden of Eden. And then verse 5 and 6 talk about physical healings that take place for those people in, that, that come into the Millennial Kingdom. And then in verse 8 through 10, 
Isaiah talks about the highway. Have you ever heard about the highway? Well, here is a passage of scripture where Isaiah talks about um, the highway, and he calls it the highway of holiness. You see, Back in those days, there would be roads that would go from one city to another, and people could travel a particular road, and some highways were known as being very safe, and some highways were known as being very dangerous. There were also certain highways that only the kings could travel on, and the people could not, and um, kind of like a maybe uh, a toll road that we you know, we would have today. Not everyone would want to travel that, um, but the ones that can do. This highway that Isaiah talks about is a road for travel that actually, it's a physical road that actually leads to Jerusalem. And God's people in the millennium are allowed to travel on this road, and they travel this road because they come to Jerusalem three times a year to repeat the festivals. And it just paints a picture that people from all over the world will want to travel this King's Highway to go see Jesus in Jerusalem. I know, I want to be one of those that gets to travel that highway, don't you? Now, in Micah 4, I'm going to jump ahead just a little bit, but Micah 4, it continues with the millennial period. And it's entitled in my Bible, The Lord's Future Reign. And let's just talk about the thousand-year reign for just a minute. And isn't it amazing that these prophets of thousands of years ago have so much to say about this period that hasn't even happened yet? Here's what we can learn from Micah about the thousand-year reign. People from all over the world will come to Jerusalem to worship Jesus. Jesus teaches there. He is mediating disputes there, much like Solomon did. There is no war. Verse 3 talks about that. And then verse 4, I just have to share with you. Micah 4, 4. Everyone will live in peace and prosperity, enjoying their grapevines and fig trees, for there will be nothing to fear. How do you like that? That sounds like an amazing time to me, a time that I surely would want to experience. How about you? And then it goes on to say that Jesus himself makes this promise. And he is certainly able to make this promise because he's the one in complete control of fulfilling it. So that is so interesting. It's just wonderful. Now Micah 4, starting with verse 6 to 13, we read about the exile. It's kind of like when you're reading scripture, you really have to it's helpful to have a Bible that kind of divides these sections, and ours does that pretty well. And it tells us that this section now is talking about something else. You know, the prophets can be ranting about one thing, and then all of a sudden, and sometimes within a verse, they're switching themes one to another. So here in verse 6, the theme switches to the exile, and it says that the nation of exile will be exiled the nation of Israel, sorry, will be exiled by Babylon, and that happens in 586 B.C. We are in 703 B.C. right now in our reading, today and tomorrow. So this hasn't even happened yet uh, as far as our reading goes. Many nations will gather against you. And then, of course, this is talking about the year 20-something. We don't know. It hasn't happened yet. And then... It says, they do not understand. I brought them here to trample them. I will defeat them, and then you can bring their riches into the temple in verse 13. Now, I was just reading Micah 4, verse 6 to 13, and it was just a, a capsule, a summary capsule of over 2,000 years of history. That's pretty amazing. Micah 5 I know some of you are familiar with some of the passages because this is where it proclaims that the Messiah will come from Bethlehem. And it's in verse 1 through 6. In verse 2, the ruler will come from Bethlehem. And isn't it just like God to pick one of the smallest villages to bring one of the greatest or the greatest king? Verse 3, it says, Israel would be abandoned to their enemies until the woman gives birth. And woman gives birth is simply a prophetic um, symbol. It's a description to describe the day of the Lord. These 
a couple of years at the end times that haven't happened yet where the Lord will um, bring vengeance upon the world and, um, of course, culminate in the last battle of Armageddon. It says Israel will return to the land. Jesus will bring them home himself and stand with them. And Jesus will be highly honored all over the world. And that is in verse 4. Then his people will live there undisturbed, and he will be highly honored throughout the world. The first time Jesus came, he was scorned, mocked, murdered, and left to die on a cross. The second time he will come will be much, much different because he will come as a lion, defeating his enemies. He will take over as king of the entire world. He will restore Israel to the full borders of their land. And here he will finally receive the honor and glory that he is so deserving of. Aren't you excited with me that this is all going to come to pass? And at the end of Micah 5, in verses 7 to 15, we see Israel, too, receives their due honor and glory. They are no longer chastised by the nations, much like they are today. They are respected. There is no war. There are no idols in the land of Israel, and there are no fortune tellers in the land of Israel. For Israel has become a holy nation, a priesthood, who lives for their Messiah, to worship and to serve him. And this is what we have to look forward to in the Millennial Kingdom. Well, I hope today's lesson has been a blessing to you. Tomorrow we are going to continue, but we go back into Second Chronicles tomorrow. So we kind of go back. We're going to pick up the history books where we left off. And we, you'll recall we, le we left off with Assyria about to invade Judah. And we've been talking a lot about that over the past couple of weeks. But tomorrow we're going to pick it back up in the history books as we continue in our reading. Blessings to you and your family until we meet again. Shalom. Shalom.